Hey guys, I'm measuring the speaker today, uh, the speakers that we have on our online course. What I'm gonna show you in this series of clips is how to measure speakers accurately. As you can see, I'm in my garage, garage with a disco ball. Highly ideal for measuring speakers. Why? Because there's lots of reflective surfaces. When I measure the speakers, we get something from the floor, the sound bouncing from the floor, the walls, and the ceiling. I don't want to record those bouncing sounds, but I want to record the sound only coming from the speaker. To do this, we apply a technique called the quasi-anechoic measurement technique. And quasi meaning similar to an anechoic chamber measurement. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply a filter to filter out the reflective sounds and only keep the sound coming from the speaker. So system setup. What I have is a speaker on a ladder. It's roughly 1.6 meters above the floor. I have the microphone sitting on an esky, very important part of the test setup. And it is at the height of the tweeter, very important. I have the microphone one meter away from the speaker. And on the back of the speaker, I have a series of alligator clips. Yeah, sorry. A series of alligator clips with a voltmeter. The reason why I have a voltmeter is so that I can record 2.83 volts which is one watt of power going into the speaker that allows me to test sensitivity of the speaker i have an amplifier that is feeding the speaker the amplifier connected to the computer by way of an auxiliary cable and then i'm using their awesome program rew if you want to get into room acoustics speaker making this is your number one program that you're going to need rew free download and i highly recommend it in addition to the amp i have the microphone connected to the computer via usb travels across the floor and then goes up to the back of the mic now the next step is we want to find out at what point are we at 2.83 volts one watt of power to the speaker so what i've done is i've up um, I've opened up the generator and I've put a sine wave at 200 hertz minus 5.8 decibels. Press play. And we can see now that we're playing roughly at 2.83 volts. I can't get to 2.83 because my test system's not accurate enough, but that is close. Let's measure the speakers. To do this, we're going to run a sweep. We're gonna run a sweep from 50 hertz, so low frequency starting at 50, all the way up to 20 kilohertz. We wanna make sure that we have minus, not plus 5.8 dB, otherwise it'll be too loud. There we go. And now we've said run, start measuring. From that, we get our frequency response. So as you can see, the graph the line is not flat, there's lots of peaks and troughs. This is because we're getting cancellation from the reflection point from the walls, ceilings and walls. So to get rid of this, we need to first go by looking at the impulse response. If you can see here, this is our main impulse, this one here. That's the speaker, and then that's all the, the final um, development of the low frequencies. Then from here, no sound, and then we get some reflections. This is here, this is likely to be the reflections off the ladder, and they're not big. See how the amplitude's not very high? I wouldn't worry about these, but I would worry about this. This is the floor. That's when the reflection occurs. And if we look at the time, it occurs at 6.42 seconds. So that means what we want to do is we want to cut out all the measurements from that period. So from here onwards, from here to here, we keep it and all this stuff behind it, we eliminate it. Because this is what calling the peaks and troughs in our frequency response. So I've come back to my frequency response and there's a thing called gating where we're going to, or also known as windowing, we're going to get rid of that stuff in the impulse response that we don't want. So everything behind 6.4 milliseconds is uh, eliminated. So let's have let's put 6.4 into our windowing. Can you see that? 6.4. Let's see what it does to the frequency response. Whoa, see that? That had made our frequency response nice and smooth. That's because now we are only measuring the speaker. And this is a quasi-anechoic measurement. This is what it will look like in a quasi-anechoic chamber. And so if you're ever gonna make speakers or you ever wanna do recordings, this is how you do it. So from looking at our frequency response, what can we see? What we can see is that at 
2.83 volts, so one watt, we're getting around about 83 decibels of average um, sensitivity. So 83 decibels per one watt at one meter away. If you follow it, you see some peaks, you see a little bit of a dip, you know, some peaks, but it's very difficult and almost impossible to get a flat frequency response. I've never seen one, and uh, if anyone's achieved it, let me know. But from what I understand is that it's not achievable. You can see some dips, right? You might go, well, that's not good, but that is 82.7. And then if we come to our deepest trough, we come over, that's 80 dB. So that means that 2.7 dB down. If we look at our maximum, we are 85.3. So this response is less than plus or minus three decibel, which is really good. If you want to make a speaker and you want to get plus or minus three dB, then you're doing good. If you can get it down to one, that's sensational. And to be honest, when you get to that sort of level, it's like you got to make sure everything is spot on. And that includes having mash pairs of speakers, tweeters, mash capacitors and resistors and ductors. And when you go into that level, you're looking at an expensive speaker. And I really don't think it's necessary because picking the difference between plus or minus three and one is very small. And when we talk about the effects of a room, so how the room boosts and subtracts um, sound, then it's no real point. Plus or minus three dB to me is good enough done so far is we've done the measurement for both the tweeter and woofer playing at the same time. We call this the summed response. But what we're going to do is measure the tweeter and woofer separately. So get the response for each. To do this, we're going to measure so the woofer first. That's the woofer um, circuit and that's the tweeter circuit. We'll do the woofer first. So I've got my sweep. Let's run that for our woofer. Same with everything, nothing changed. Notice how you don't hear many high frequencies in that, just mo mostly low. Well, that's the crossover in action. Now what we're gonna do is measure the tweeter. So these go up to here. There we go. To measure the tweeter, same settings again. Notice how you didn't hear any low frequencies. So here's the frequency response of the woofer, the woofer only. 200 Hertz, you can see it's pretty flat and it ducts slope down. That's the crossover in action. Now let's have a look at the tweeter. That's a red line. You can see it's a high frequency, relative flat, and then it starts to slope down. Let's look at the sum response. See that? In the middle, they start to sum. So you can see that when the woofer and tweeter play together, it had an effect on the sum response. That's how um, we get the sum response. It's a summing of the tweeter and woofer when they play together. The last bit of measuring that I like to do is I like to have a look at the, um, the phase response of the speaker. So we're going to inverse, so switch um, the terminals on the tweeter so we can see how far the cancellation goes. What we should get here is big cancel, a big null. The deeper the null, the better in phase the crossover is, meaning the woofer and tweeter are playing in phase when it's summed, and then when it's out of phase, there's a big cancellation in the sum response. So let's do that now. So to measure a speaker in phase, I'd have the woofer and tweeter connected like to this, so the positive woofer to the positive of the tweeter circuit, and then negative of the woofer circuit to the negative of the tweeter circuit. But what I'm gonna do, Instead of connecting to this one, I'm going to flip it. So now that means the tweeter is out of phase with the woofer. And then the negative of the woofer go to the positive of the tweeter. There we go. So I've taken the measurement of the tweeter out of phase with the woofer. And as you can see, you had a big cancellation. The measurement gets comes down and then goes back up. This shows us that the tweeter and woofer are, are in phase and the deeper this is, obviously, the better in phase it is. This measurement shows us that we're 25 dB down, which is, to me, pretty good. So, all in all, I'm thinking this speaker is looking pretty damn fine. What I've done so far is I've measured the frequency response of both the woofer, tweeter, and the sum response on axis. So that means directly in front of the speaker, like that. But now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure the directivity of the speaker. So how the speaker disperses sound along the horizontal axis. That, if we imagine this is on axis, and it is on axis, right? That's what we 
typically like to listen to, but what we want to see is how does it sound when we start to move around the speaker. And this will tell us how well the speaker disperses sound. So what I've done is I've marked the center point, um, so where the speaker is relatively on the floor. And then I've got a bit of blue tack that denotes the on access response, so one meter away from that center point of the floor. Then I've got the next one here, which is 20 degrees off axis, but also one meter away from that center point, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, and 90 degrees. I'm gonna move my microphone and bucket, or esky, around all these locations, and I'm gonna measure my dispersion. So I've had to move my laptop on the floor to get the cable to reach the microphone. So the final bit of the puzzle is to look at the off-axis response of the speaker. First, we'll compare the 20 degree off-axis response with the on-axis. So the brown line is the on-axis and the green line is the 20 degree off-axis. And we can see that the 20 degree traces very close to the on-axis response. This shows great dispersion at 20 degrees. Even at um, 16 kilohertz, we're only around about 4 dB down which is nothing, so great dispersion at 20 degrees. Let's have a look at 45 degrees. Same thing, look how close that tracks. It's only really at 10 kilohertz, it starts to fall away. So awesome response as well. And then if we look at both 60 and 90, we're getting great responses. Unreal. So this is a great dispersing speaker. So all in all, I'm pretty stoked with the measurement for this in-home core speaker. Flat frequency for response, great phase tracking that was seen in the inverse response and then the dispersion is also awesome so all in all great speaker so if anyone's got any questions or would like me to clarify anything please um send me a dm oh uh, keen to help you guys out keen to share my knowledge and yeah cheers